All right. So let's get started then. Um, and um, today is our fifth lecture, and we're going to talk about um, customer segmentation and um, clustering. So first of all, what's customer segmentation and uh, why business wants it? Um, you know, in general, segmentation it's a practice of um, you know, dividing the customer base um, into groups of individuals that are similar in some specific way, right? So finding groups of similar customers, and you know, typically one can use either location-based segmentation. Um, it could be demographic, um, it can be behavioral, or uh, sort of more advanced as sort of psychographic segmentation, where you do have certain properties, like for example, you know, age, gender, occupation, and you try to group people based on those properties. Now, why would you want um, to do that? Uh, yeah, there is again the question about the audio settings. Let me try to do it a little bit louder. Okay, so why would you want to, why would business want to do segmentation? I mean, um, obviously the efficiency um, of, of marketing services of marketing really depends on the precision of the messaging, right? Of the information you provide to what to to, to different people, and um, you do want to focus, try to send them the right message to the right person at the right time. Um, I mean, ultimate goal, of course, is sort of personalized marketing, where you create a personal message for every person, for every customer. Um, in reality, this is extremely hard to do simply because, um, you know, large corporations have millions and millions of clients. You know, think about, um, you know, Sberbank with 100 million users, right? So, you know, you cannot uh, literally technically do uh, absolutely personal sort of message per per customer, but what you can do is uh, instead of sending one bulk message for all of your customers is to split them into groups, into those segments, right? And then try to target based on the interest. You don't want to overwhelm people with uh, amount of mail. You don't want to send offers that are not relevant to people. So um, that's why you want to um, group them. And uh, for the particular groups, you want to send particular marketing materials, particular offers, or sometimes even um, set up, um, you know, customized uh, products and, and, and services. And, and it's very clear that the interest for, you know, the, 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 the generation X, Y, Z, or, or, or millennials, or, or um, older people, they're, they're very, very different. You can also provide different pricing um, for different customers, for different segments, because the willingness to pay of different segments can be very different. So um, pretty much segmentation is a holy grail for the market. Now, um, what kind of models can we use? Well, um, you know, if there is a demographic information available, and that's quite often is available, like age, gender, income, education, um, that can be used. You know, geographic segmentation is um, always easily done, and especially today, uh, since every app um, or um, every time you make a purchase, you either know the store or if you use your online services, you know location. Um, you know, there are, there are a lot of services that tries to do psychographic segmentation, um, for example, using um, your social network profiles and social network activities. Um, you know, there is the, the possible segmentation would be on, on um, you know, mobile use or desktop use. Um, extremely important is behavioral segmentation, which is really your interaction with the services. So for example, frequency of the action or, or type of the project, uh, type of the product you use. Um, and, and there are other segmentations that can be, be can be, um, you know, value-based or, or need-based, et cetera, et cetera. Now, one of the popular ways to segment customers are based on, on, on a behavior is so-called RFM metrics, um, which is recency, frequency, 
and monetary side. So recency is obviously um, the freshness of the customer activity. So sort of when was the last time um, the customer interacted with the service? Frequency is how frequently the customer interacts, um, again, for, you know, for, for a selected time frame. And uh, well, the, the value on monetary things, that's uh, the value, how much money the customer spends on your services. So um, obviously, you know, you, you might have very recent customers or frequent customers, but they don't spend a lot. Um, it, it's probably not very interesting, right? The most valuable, are, of course, those who um, visit frequently and those who spend a lot, right? Okay. So um, here is one of the sort of uh, RFM segments analysis where based on, and, and this is a two-dimensional presentation where we're only looking at um, recency and frequency scores, um, and we can partition customers into um, different groups. Um, uh, for example, and I mean, you know, mar marketers, um, Department of Marketing usually like to give um, some sort of flashy names to different groups of customers, right? And here you can see like, okay, can lose them or, or champions, those who, who, who frequently um, buy frequently and, and quite recently their loyal customers need attention, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but, you know, names aside, the key here is, uh, that those boundaries that you see, um, the partitioning into the groups is, is quite arbitrarily, right? So somebody in the marketing department decided, okay, well, look, you know, we, we have like five levels of recency score and um, yeah, let's partition this in between two and three and, 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 you know, maybe three and four, four and five. And the frequency scores, um, how, how often um, they, they purchase. So, um, this partitioning, this grouping is somewhat, you know, handmade, somewhat arbitrarily. Um, it is what the marketing department decided and sort of it can be as good as any other sort of partitioning. And uh, whether it makes sense or not, it, it usually depends really on the experience of the marketing department. Now, we can try to do better, right? And one of the ways of doing better is by looking um, at um, the, the, the data itself and um, uh, at the histograms, right? So with our naked eye, we can actually do, you know, univariate analysis, which means we can look at one feature at a time and try to do some partitioning uh, by hand by looking at that particular feature. Now, um, here is a very simple example. Um, no, obviously, you know, male, female, that's, that's easy partitioning. Um, but let's say we look at um, uh, annual income and, and what you see is a histogram, right, um, of sort of customers with different annual income. Um, you know, you can, you can think about this, okay, we can partition it to make it more or less sort of balanced, uh, maybe, you know, or, or let's say here, and, and we can split here and there, or maybe we can split, you know, right there. Um, you know, we look at the age distribution, again, depending on what we're um, looking for. If you want to have equal, for example, uh, buckets with equal sizes, we probably can, can split right here, right? Um, there, are, there are sort of less, uh, you know, there, there, there are a few people who, of different ages, but there's like, bigger range of ages. Um, or, you know, if we, if we target some, some other ideas, like say spending score, we realize that, okay, most of the people here, you know, high spenders are here in this narrow um, region. Um, so this is already better than just sort of randomly drawing boundaries. But at the same time, um, if we look uh, carefully um, on, on the right, right, these are the data points um, you know, those three, you, you, we don't have here gender, but those three uh, parameters, those three variables, you realize that um, when you look at this in, in 3D, right, there are really some sort of groups of, of points 
and each point is a customer that seems to like lay down next to each other, which means they're forming some natural groups, right? Um, and, and, and those, you know, there are some boundaries, but they're not very obvious, of course. And, you know, if you have three dimensions, yeah, fine. In three, you can even try to do it by hand, but if you have five, 10 dimensions, you cannot do it by hand anymore. And so it would be very good to have a technique that would allow you to actually um, find those natural occurring groups of customers. Um, natural occurring means um, um, they, they have similar behavior and similar sort of properties that um, tend to group them together. And so the, the mathematical way to do this is through you know, unsupervised learning technique, which is called clustering. So with clustering, the key there compared to all the previous methods we looked at is that um, with clustering, we do not have a target variable. Um, it, it's an unsupervised learning, so um, there is no target. And the goal is to discover some hidden patterns in data. Um, we can, as a, as a result, every point um, or every customer, in this case, will be assigned to a cluster. Now, um, here, um, you know, it's, it's kind of obvious um, that, you know, this points, uh, I missed this one, right? This points all grouped together, sort of this points all grouped together, and this points all group together. And, and so it's obvious here that like, yeah, we have some sort of three clusters, though, you know, even, even on this picture, you can argue um, that, you know, well, maybe there are, there, are, there are a smaller cluster here, and maybe there's some, or maybe this whole thing is one big cluster. So in supervised learning, um, there is no, in, I'm sorry, in unsupervised learning, there is no sort of ground truth. Um, and, and there is no, perfect solution that we're looking for, right? Um, we're trying to do sort of the best we can in putting um, similar points, right? Um, close to each other and calling them a cluster. Now, the same as in supervised learning, we also have different, you know, features. Um, um, it can be, you know, features can be, uh, numerical or can be categorical or can be both numerical and categorical, but we do not have, again, we do not have a target variable. In supervised learning, in regression, we had numerical target. In classification, we had categorical target. Here, we do not have a target. Um, there is a bunch of clustering algorithms. Um, we look at three of them, k-means, hierarchical, and db-scan, uh, but there are more out there, um, these are probably the three most popular and um, easy to understand and uh, implement. So we start with, uh, before, before actually we go into clustering, one thing which is, which is very important to touch upon is this notion of similarity or distance. The, 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 the entire algorithm, Pretty much any clustering algorithms algorithm is based on the notion of um, similarity of data points or closeness of data points, if you wish. And so, depending on how you know you define the distance, you might get different results. Now, the easiest way, of course, if you have numerical um, features, then you know we can use Euclidean distance, for example, right? And and uh, you know if if this is our real problem the way we see it on this slide yeah euclidean distance will with distance will work just you know fine so um the the we will group together the points that have the shortest distance between them the shortest euclidean distance um but it's not not always the case you know you you might want to use instead of that use manhattan distance which is um you know the, the differ from euclidean distance by um this uh, absolute value and uh, on, the, on the difference. Um, or you can use Pearson correlation uh, distance, 
or we're going to use similarity metric, which is a cosine similarity metric, which is very similar to Pearson correlation. So um, any kind of distance uh, will work. Um, often you, want, you might want to try sort of different distance metric to get the right result. Um, if you have, if we have a, um, categorical variables or sort of, uh, you know, mixed uh, situation, then it, it becoming more challenging. Um, in case of the categorical variables, like for example, if there is a sex and it's binary, um, you, we have to numerically encode it uh, with zeros and ones. Um, but if we have more than binary, sort of more possibilities, then we you know, usually use what's called one-hot encoding to do this. So, k-means. Um, the idea is, and it's, k means is probably like sort of this grandfather of all clustering methods, and it's um, probably one of the most popular and, and, and sort of easy to understand, easy to control um, and, and, and manage uh, you know, methods and widely, widely used. Um, the idea is um, that we iteratively build clusters uh, by choosing, uh, by, by putting together the closest. Uh, Manhattan Pearson, yes, it's, it's all numeric. It's just different ways to, to deal with numeric, numerical values. Um, so um, the way k-means work is the following. Um, initially, on the, on the step zero, we uh, oh, and one thing, one important thing, um, when we when we try to do clustering, um, the big question usually is how many clusters are out there, right? And of course, we want our algorithm to discover us it itself. How many clusters are there? Um, it's not always possible. With k means, in fact, you need to specify how many clusters you want to discover. And k-means will, will, will find for you as many clusters as you request. Now, as a post-processing step to k-means, we can actually run it with different requested number of clusters and uh, find out which gives us the best result. And so in this sense, yeah, k-means can also be used without knowing how many clusters you need to. You just run it multiple times with a different number of clusters, with requesting a different number of clusters. So here I show you the, um, the, the run with three clusters. The idea is the following. Uh, we randomly, um, you know, with k clusters, we randomly, um, you know, assign, you know, we can either randomly assign uh, every point to one of three clusters, right? Or we can, uh, uh, alternatively, we can uh, select three points as initial centroids. It really does matter. Um, what we show here on step one is we sort of randomly coloring, um, assigning points to clusters. Then for each color, for each cluster, we calculate centroid. Uh, it's calculated as just a mean of, of all data points. And then we go and reassign every point to its nearest cluster. After that, we recalculate the value of new formed clusters, get new centroids right here. And on next step, we again reassign to the closest and recalculate new centroids. And notice here they, you know, quickly separated. And then we just keep doing it until no more changes observed. So if you notice, there is there is a sort of dramatic change from from this step to this, and you know, big change here, and then there is sort of minor changes for assigning sort of last points. You know, mathematically, what we do is we calculate 
on every iteration, we calculate the distance in between every point that belongs to the cluster, to the centroid, right? Uh, so for every point, again, we measure the distance to each of the three centroids and assign that point to the nearest one. And then we calculate these distances and add them up. And ultimately the whole algorithm, what it does is minimizes the total sum. Now, as I said, it's all start with selecting, you know, either K points randomly or, um, you know, coloring it in, in uh, uh, K sort of colors, right? Assigning uh, initial points to K clusters. So the algorithm will work whether we assign it, whether we do it two or three or five or 10 clusters, it will converge. But the initial, the, the final sort of value, this final value will be different. And the optimal one uh, should give us, uh, should, should, should have us, should give us the smallest. Okay. So here is an example. On the same data set, uh, we initiated and tried to, to find two clusters, three clusters, and four clusters. And if you notice, um, it actually did find, okay, you know, two clusters, and it sort of makes sense, right? Three clusters, well, it also made makes sense. Um, four clusters, well, it's the same, the same data, but, you know, Maybe it's even better than, than, than two or three. So, um, and that's a challenge of unsupervised learning that, you know, you don't have the target variable, you don't have the, you know, the, the perfect, the correct answer you want to try to achieve. Um, you know, you're, you, you're doing the clustering, you find the grouping, and then you're analyzing them and trying to figure out which one is the best for your, for your task. Now, if you look to the right, uh, what we have here um, is we calculated that, 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 that value, which is the sum of the distances from each point to corresponding you know, centroid. So here is for these guys, um, then for these guys, all sum of the distances to the centroid. There's centroids somewhere here and some of the distances to the centroids from each point. And then we added them up, right? And that's what's plotted here. And uh, if we put all of them in one cluster, that would be the value. If we put them in two clusters, that would be the value in three clusters. This is and for this is. And, and by looking at this, um, it feels like, well, you know, the more clusters you get, you know, the smaller this number, but typically, um, in here, uh, in, in k-means, you, you're looking for the elbow in this curve, so the, the, the spot where kind of curve changes um, the, the, the shape, right? Um, sort of, it goes down and then it kind of starts letting out. And, and, and this is the area where we think, that we think corresponds to the optimal number of clusters. So you can think about here as, as sort of diminishing return point where, um, you know, you get more clusters, but the, the, the total sum um, re reducing much, much less. Um, but at the same time, um, again, um, it, it's important to look at your business objective and see, uh, you know, what kind of, number of clusters make sense, you know, 10 clusters or, or, or five clusters or 50. Okay, so this is k-means. Now, k-means works uh, nicely for uh, when you have not a very large um, number. Excuse me. Um, when you have uh, not a very large number of clusters. Um, when you have more data, um, there are other methods that are probably a bit more beneficial. Um, the second approach I'm gonna look at is agglomerative clustering. Um, and um, this one um, has a, a very, very different 
um, logic behind it. So the idea in agglomerative clustering is in uh, building um, so what's called dendrogram or building a tree by uh, merging together, putting together um, points that are near each other or most similar to each other. Um, as a result of agglomerative clustering, um, you'll get this, what's called dendrogram, the one we see at the bottom. And uh, we're going to discuss it in a second. Um, and then you need to post-process it uh, to actually get clusters. Um, you know, the big plus of this agglomerative clustering, it's also, you know, it's always works and uh, it does not require you uh, to, uh, to provide um, the, 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 the number of clusters you want, right? It just builds this dendrogram for all the data points you have. Though later on, you need to decide also, um, you know, how to split this, how to split this tree into clusters. So, uh, how does it work? Well, it's bottom-up agglomerative construction, which is you take, uh, you know, you, you need, and it's actually quite computationally expensive. You need to look at uh, pairwise distances of all points, and then pick up those, select those that are closest to each other and merge them into a cluster. Then, for example, you know, you, you, you look for another uh, pairwise distance and you find that this is the shortest one and you merge it. Then you keep looking and you realize that, okay, the distance in between the, the, the new point D and these two points is the smallest. And so you merge them into one group. Um, then you realize, okay, the distances between these groups and AC is the shortest one, and you merge them, and then F. So this merging can be reflected in um, the so-called dendrogram. Um, the way to read this is the following. On the bottom, yes, these are our points, A, C, B, D, F, and here's the distance. And if you notice, um, you know, the shortest, the, distance, the shortest distance here is between points A and C. Here we join them into one cluster, and that's uh, sort of the distance in between points. Then, um, you know, we, we look at the, we, we continue looking and realize that the next uh, is B and E, and we join them into one cluster. Then we realize that, okay, the closest to them is D and added to this cluster and grew it, then merged with this two. And this merging is reflected by this line, right? And then the last one. And so as a result, you get this dendrogram and, uh, you know, depending on the distance you select, you actually have different number of clusters. So you usually say, you know, you cut, um, the dendrogram at certain level, this uh, dendrogram tree at certain level. For example, if I, you know, decide to cut it at this level, I will have one cluster, I'll have second cluster, um, I'll have the third cluster, I'll have the fourth cluster. This is just um, single points. Or if I say, okay, look, um, you know, this is this this is a distance that I want to select, um, then I will have this cluster, this cluster, and this separate point. So instead of selecting how many clusters you want, you are um, selecting the distance about which uh, you, know, you will have to merge things, and below you consider them separately. Now, in, in real life, though, you do have the sort of the distance metric, but nobody really looks at the sort of at the numbers. People typically, when they have this tree, they should just sort of try to slice it at the different levels. They will get different number of clusters. Um, and then they, they, they select the level that gives them the, the, the number of clusters that sort of works the best for them. Now, the great thing about, um, again, this agglomerative clustering that you run this algorithm once, 
and then you get clusters as a post-processing step so you don't need to rerun Guys, I think connection dropped. Can you see my screen? No, no. not yet. Not yet. <laughs> okay. So where where did I lose you? The word rerun. Okay. Ah. Oh. Not, not, not that much stuff. Okay, so um, um, yes, so we don't need to rerun it. Um, you know, there's expensive computations every time. Uh, we build this dendrogram tree once and then sort of slice it, partition it, um, uh, you know, on, on a different level and, and, and see what happens. Plus, also, um, when you get this agglomerative clustering, this hierarchy, it allows you, it, it gives you some sort of understanding on, on, on how things are uh, building up, right? So it gives you this sort of hierarchical structure um, to your data. Uh, you start realizing which sort of data points are close to, to each other um, than to the rest. Um, there are different sort of flavors of, of um, agglomerative clusterings uh, when, you know, there are, of course, uh, you know, distance metrics, um, the same as, as in, in K-means, but also the ways we, we provide this sort of linkage or agglomerating. Um, there is so-called single, complete, average, centroid. So this is, that depends on um, whether we, for example, when we're calculating the distance in between two clusters in order to uh, put them um, into the tree, whether we measure, for example, you know, the, sh I cannot draw straight, um, you know, the shorter distance or whether, or whether in between them and that call the distance between clusters, or if we, for example, calculate, you know, centroid for each cluster and use that distance as a metric. Um, and depending on that, it's called single, complete, average, centroid, et cetera. And all, all of these are parameters that you can select um, when you, you know, you run the algorithm. All right, finally, um, one more algorithm, which is actually quite, also quite popular, is called uh, DBSCAN. Um, it's so-called, it's density, well, DBSCAN stands for density-based spatial clustering in application with noise. So the idea here is that, um, and it's sort of like somewhat, somewhat deep idea, that um, you know the data points that we have, um, they came from certain distribution, um, and um, you know like certain multidimensional histogram, and those data points are just samples from that histogram, and um, then in, you know in the real world, right? In 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 um, there was actually a smooth distribution from which we sample those points, and the clustering in this sense is trying to find the right boundaries on this distribution. And so we have this, um, it can also think about it as, as a sort of density or you know, the, the number of, of, if you wish, the number of, um, the, the distribution can be thought of as a real sort of density of data points in different parts of the space because that's what distribution is, right? And so um, this model tries to sort of from, from, from the data tries to think of this density distribution that's shown here as a sort of hills. And uh, then, you know, again, based on certain parameters, um, cut it into um, clusters. So here, we also do not need to provide number of clusters, uh, but instead we have to give two other parameters, 
One parameter is uh, sort of neighborhood radius um, within which uh, you, you know you 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 look for um, uh, data points. So the no, the idea is that um, you know your uh, the density or the density is a number of points that 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 fit within this um, radius, and you specify this radius and you know minimum number of points that get there so um the way it works is the following sort of uh we're trying to again randomly select any any point um and uh, then from this point uh we look for within the radius or the given radius and see if there are other data points you know, within this radius um if there are more than minimum number of points. We call it a cluster. We start this cluster, and then we move to every point within this cluster and see if it has any other neighbors within this epsilon distance. And if it does, um, we kind of grow this cluster. And if we get a point um, like point N here um, that uh, within the epsilon distance doesn't have any other points, we call it um, an outlier or noise, and it's not being used in any cluster. And uh, um, also, if we get a point that is closest, that, that is close to the point you got there, like point B, for example, but it doesn't have any other points, you know, it still belongs to a cluster, but um, this point is sort of on the fringe, right? It's the border of the cluster. And you do this, you kind of starting with a seed point and you kind of grow these clusters, right? Until it reaches the boundaries and then it stops. Um, and, uh, you know, if there are points left that are not part of the clusters, you try to seed them and start this process again from those points. If there is not nobody, no points in the neighborhood, um, the, the point is classified as noise. Um, and you do this, until uh, uh, you know, you start with all, well, you know, as, as uh, until until you cover all the points, any number of neighbors uh, or also minimum number of points to form a cluster. Yes, there is a minimum number of points to form a cluster. You need to provide that, right? Um, you you know, you 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 pretty much specify here um, the radius you look for and the minimum number of points that you want to be within this radius um, to call it a cluster. So these are three methods, probably you know three most popular methods for uh, clustering. Now, there exist many more methods, and here is a test of of some of them on a different uh, test sets. Now, um, these are two dimensional um, test sets, um, and and you know typically. I would say in, in the real world, you know, you will meet this kind of, this kind of, this kind of situation, right? Um, this, this, and this are a little bit artificial, but um, they kind of show you how different methods handle sort of strange situations, right? Um, Sort of k means this is a k means minimum batch k means is just one of the version of k means. Um, if you notice, uh, you know k means, uh, you know you, you you tell k means you know find three clusters, find two clusters, it will just do it, right? Um, though you know here it mistaken, here it's mistaken, here it's also kind of not good and here yeah there's single cluster obviously but you know it was told to find three well it found three um agglomerative clustering worked a little better right you know it correctly discovered clusters here correctly did here and yeah, did pretty good job right here um some mistakes here good job here uh you know some weird pieces here and there, but overall not bad. Um, out of those, dbscan is really probably the, the best out of the three methods we selected, right? It, it did well here, did well here. Notice um, it actually, because it looked at the density distribution, right? Notice there are black points. Those are outliers, right? 
um, sort of it cannot confidently put it into any of the groups. But at the same time, notice that it kind of calculated or, or, or called this one also uh, part of this bigger cluster, right? Did well here, well, well. Now, obviously, each and every uh, method did really well um, on the situation uh, when there is a very clear separation. Um, and, but, you know, in, in real life, this is probably the most likely scenario you're gonna, you're gonna have with your data points. Um, notice also that we um, use here two dimensions, right? And so it's very easy to visualize. Um, typically you will have multi-dimensional data. And so in order to do this type of pictures, um, you will have to do you know, slices or we'll have to do dimensionality reduction. We're gonna talk about it in a second. Or you can do like sort of two dimensional slices, but ultimately um, you want to learn to use metrics, right? Um, so that you will understand how well your, your method works even without um, doing the, the clustering itself. Okay, so I have mentioned dimensionality reduction. Uh, sort of what's the idea of dimensionality reduction? Um, actually, before we go there, um, any questions on clustering? Okay, dimensionality reduction. Um, the, the, the idea here is the following, that um, very often you have um, data with that lives in multiple dimensions, right? You know, you have data that, that has, you know, 40 dimensions, for example, right? Sort of 40 different features um, or 100 or, you know, who knows how many. And uh, um, interestingly enough, um, quite often, because, uh, well, quite often you get, first of all, some correlation between those dimensions. So, you know, features are somewhat correlated, for example. Um, like income and age can be sort of can, can, can be correlated um, to some extent. Um, and, 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 and sometimes you want to reduce the number of dimensions in your data, right? Um, it can also be helpful, well, to visual to, in order for visualizing the data, right? It's hard to visualize five-dimensional data, but we know how to visualize two-dimensional data. So instead of five variables, we'll have one variable, uh, two variables. Um, it also can help you actually, uh, surprisingly, for your both classification clustering algorithms, because also multiple dimensions can um, add noise and uh, sort of confuse your your algorithms. Now, the most naive way of, of reducing dimensionality is to just, you know, look at, at your variables and say, okay, look, I think this is not important. This is not important. That's not important. That's one of the ways. Um, another way might be, okay, you know, you look at the variance per variable, per dimension and see, you know, if dimension doesn't have a lot of variance, if all the data, um, all the values are sort of close to each other, well, you can drop that. That's possible. But what do you do if sort of variance is somewhat, you know, somewhat similar and um, along the dimensions, right? Um, what do you do? And so PCA principal component analysis is sort of a method that really operates on this variance idea, right? But instead of just dropping one variable, and instead of selecting variable with the smallest var variance, it actually looks at the entire data and finds the direction of the largest variance and preserves that. And that direction can be combination of all the variables you have, right? Not necessarily one, it's just actually a combination, a linear combination, and that's principal component analysis is a linear technique, so it's a linear combination. And finds that direction, and allows you to, you know, preserve, for example, that direction, or maybe that direction and the next and the next, um, sorted by by the variance. And so that's pretty much the the idea of PCA. So it's constructing of new orthogonal bases, and bases is really coordinate axis, 
um, along the direction of the largest variance in the data. So let me be you know, very sort of precise and clear here. If I take um, X1, notice that the data varies from sort of minus 15 to well, probably plus 15 or plus 20, right? So that's sort of the variance in X1. If you look at X2, it actually varies also coordinates varies from minus 15 plus plus 15. So it's like around 30 here. Here it's around also 30. So if I look at just each of the variances uh, along the X1 and along the X2, they're quite similar. I mean, okay, of course, this 15, uh, 15 minus, minus 15 is not the variance, right? Variance is X minus X average sum of all the data points squared, but this is a good approximation to the variance, right? It's how, how the data points are spread. So um, looking at the X axis and looking at uh, X1 axis and X2 axis, you realize, well, both of them, um, you know, the data is spread along both of them. And so there is no way to just drop um, X1 or X2 um, without losing a lot of information about your data. But what's interesting that, and, and if we visualize this, you realize that, um, but wait a minute, the data has this shape, sort of cigar-like shape, which means there is a direction, and it's called PC1 here, that has large variance, right? So large variance means again the, the 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 points that we have here they have you know coordinates spread significantly, and then there is this direction PC two, where well the coordinates spread not that much, right? So this is narrow, PC two is narrow, PC one direction is 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 wide, and so you can think about this. Imagine that we can actually find those directions. And uh, you know, for every data point, we can calculate for every data point, we know we have x1 and x2 values. But we can calculate the uh, recalculate um, and, and compute the, the coordinates of every point within this PC1, PC2 um, axis, and you will have particular values. And then the idea is the following, that if we realize that the variance along one axis, along PC1 axis is much larger than PC2 axis. So PC1 axis is much more important in distinguishing between data points because your data points are um, along that line. And so, I can probably drop the second coordinate, PC2 coordinate, and just keep PC1 coordinate, and that will give a good approximation to my data, okay? So that's the key here. I couldn't do it in X1, X2 coordinates because both X1 and X2 changes significantly. Uh, we have data points of, of all values. But when we selected PC1, PC2, PC2 has sort of small uh, range and, and PC1 has large range of changes. And so um, it feels like PC2 can be dropped. And that's the, the whole idea of principal components. Um, now the question is how to do this technically, but we're, we're gonna see it in a second. And this is what dimensionality reduction is, right? You, you reduce um, the number of dimensions, but you're not just dropping them, you linearly transforming, which means calculating linear combinations of the dimensions um, in a certain way. Now, the reason here there is this picture um, is that we can actually think about, you know, the picture as a bunch of sort of vectors. And then each vector is a, is a point in a high dimensional space. And you can, you know, run this principal component analysis on in, in this high dimensional space. And you can keep only one component like, like here, right? I drop pretty much all the information. I keep only one component and I kind of reconstruct this picture. And that's what I get, right? I pretty much, you know, leaving one component, I threw away all the information. 
But then if I have five components, well, I start getting some shapes. If I get nine components, I get better shape. And with 21 components, it's even better. And 29 components, this actually looks, you can recognize a face. Originally here, I think 500, um, this image is 500 by 500. So there's 500 dimensions. And, you know, it feels like reducing it to 30 dimensions, we can, you know, pretty much see the see the face, right? We might not be able to see like tiny, tiny details, uh, but, uh, you know, it's a reduction from uh, 500 to, you know, 30. And so with a lot of data, you can actually do this. Um, plus, again, as I said before, you can actually use it to uh, visualize um, the data set. Now, how do you do this technically? Well, um, the idea is, uh, I don't want to go a lot into the formulas, but the point is, yes, we're trying to find the direction um, that will maximize the variance, right? So, um, you know, we choose, we need to kind of go through different and, and uh, through different potential directions. I'll, I'll draw them here, like this direction, this direction, this direction, you know, this direction, this direction, this direction. And for each direction, calculate what would happen if uh, we project our points on that direction. And projecting points on that direction uh, really, uh, you know, calculates as a product dot product of two vectors, um, the, the vector itself, right, and the direction vector. And then, um, you know, you do it for every, for each, for every point, you know, this is a sum, and you find the direction that gives you this maximum spread, right? Sort of the, if, if I look at the previous picture, um, again, we're trying, I pretty much, what, we, what we're doing is we're trying different axes, calculating projection on this axis, and trying to find the one that has this projection, the sum of all the projections from all the points, the largest. And, and this is equivalent, you know, what I just described um, is, can be set up is this optimization problem where X is our data set and W is a sort of vector um, that the, the direction that we're looking for. And the answer is we, know, we need to find the, the, the W that makes this uh, product, this combination, the largest. Well, this combination has a name, it's called relay quotient. And uh, it is known, it can be shown in math that um, the, the largest value can be achieved here um, for the largest um, W, for, for, the, for the W being the um, eigenvector that corresponds to the largest eigenvalue of the matrix X transpose X. And so uh, literally what you need to do to, to do PCA is to form a matrix um, data transpose, multiplying transpose the data times itself, Right, and, and then run eigenvalue decomposition on this matrix and um, eigenvectors will become your uh, direction, uh, your, your, your axis, um, and they can be sorted by the corresponding values of eigenvalues and the largest eigenvalue um, corresponds to the direction, to the eigenvector that points to the direction of the largest variance and the next one to the next largest variance and the next one to the next largest variance and so on. Um, that's how you build that uh, projections. Yes, there's this good point. All axes go through point zero zero. Now, in order for this to work, in order for this to be a variance, um, what you need to do is you need to, um, and uh, by some reason I didn't, I didn't mention it here, um, you need to have a zero mean because remember the variance is, um, Variance is x i minus x average, right? Squared summation. So what we need to do here is for every point to calculate um, uh, so to calculate um, 
for I'm sorry for your fire point for every direction um, calculate uh, center right and then do the zero mean so for example um, I need to calculate uh, for for all these points for all these blue points say there is probably somewhere here the mean and then um, the vectors that we gonna look for these are the vectors and then the axis that we're going to run they're going to go through this zero so we're going to send axis you know try different axis going through this centroid through the you know this point which is zero mean calculate the dot product in between them and the green arrows right and all the data this will uh correspond to the zero mean and so yes it should go through the zero but zero is has to be defined um for the zero mean point not the original um data okay so um that's pretty much pca and uh you know why do we spend time talking about it well i mean here is a simplest example let's say we have three-dimensional data set right so points living in 3d and uh you, you know we want to visualize them we want to see if our clustering works for example um you want to reduce dimensionality you can drop one so for example one dimension one sort of variable uh randomly but you know you don't know if if you're going to see what you want to see so the good way to do this is to actually do dimensionality reduction run pca um it will uh, find you the direction of maximum variance and in this case um if we want to go from 3d to 2d um you know it find the plane so it will find two directions the, the maximum variance and the second uh, largest variance that's the plane and then we'll project all the points on that plane by uh sort of dropping um you know the the, the third eigen um the, the 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 values corresponding to the third eigen value and then you look you sort of um look you know another way to think about this is we look orthogonally to the plane right that corresponds to dropping that direction and this is a picture you're going to see so this is a two-dimensional projection, which is so sort of first principal component and second principal component. That's how they're projected. And that's your data points. And here you already see, by the way, that the clustering, and this is color coding for clustering worked more or less okay, right? So this is PCA. Um, again, it can be used uh, for, for either within clustering or classification. Um, Yeah, um, this is, you're bringing up a very good point um, that um, you know if we visualize it this way, don't we lose the ability to interpret the visualization because dimensions now don't really mean anything? It seems to me. Uh, look, very good point. Um, couple things here. Um, in general, yes, you're right that it's going to be much harder to interpret. Now, uh, having said that. Um, these are linear combinations of dimensions, right? And uh, there are things that still might make sense, but not always, all right? So PCA is not used for interpretation. It's used for, first of all, you know, visualizing and you checking um, if, you know, the, for example, your, your segmentation makes sense, right? Without really, you know, understanding too much of, um, um you know what sort of what uh along the axis right and then what's also very important that um you can actually use pca as a pre-processing step uh before you do clustering or classification and that helps you to well um reduce computational costs and also might help you um getting rid of uh noisy points right so there are sometimes you get a lot of sort of you know random points um you know noise right some sort of transactions that shouldn't be there some some mistake in the transactions and this allows you to filter it out well the same way with images when you reconstruct the image but you do not reconstruct it perfectly right you lose some 
uh, maybe some 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 subtle uh, features in the image, but at the same time, if the image had some noise, some sort of grainy noise, it will smooth it out. And so PCA um, often used as a pre-processing step for old algorithms. Um, one more thing about, um, I forgot to mention about interpretation, interpretability. One of the ways to actually gain some interpretability for the, uh, for the, cl uh, for the clustering is the following. You run the clustering algorithm. And then you assign labels to a cluster. And then you train a classifier, like a decision tree. And the decision tree classifier uh, will hopefully give you some meaningful splits, right? And by looking at the decision tree, you will understand why um, certain points went to a certain cluster. So again, you can try to do uh, clustering then you assign labels to each cluster, right? And then you train classifier on this. And then you look at the classifier, um, how it actually, for example, if you train uh, you know, some explainable classifier like a tree, um, you can look um, how it partitioned, what rules it created for partitioning um, points into certain clusters. And then that, uh, th th those are the rules that um, can be meaningful to business. Okay. Okay. So this sums up uh, pretty much the story. So we covered um, supervised learning. Uh, so we talked about regression. Uh, we talked about classification, and we covered unsupervised learning. We covered clustering. So we do have a few other techniques that we want to talk, and we're going to talk about it next time. There's going to be we're going to talk about recommender systems, uh, mask and 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 market basket analysis and uh, we also will talk about um, time dependent data uh, but that's going to be uh, some other time uh, other points and uh, another question other points and on all these examples clients or something like orders um, you know you can pretty much you know these are points right and so you can um, class you can you can cluster them. Uh, typically, uh, this is used for, uh, you know, clients or customers um, and that sort of customer segmentation. But yeah, if you want to, you know, group some orders, you know, why not? I mean, you can do that too. So it really doesn't matter. It's just the question of, uh, you know, what you use for features for the orders, right? But yes, you can do it sort of for, for any item you want. All right. With that, um, we are done for today. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Bye.